Well, good morning, everybody. Um, I'd like to welcome you to the first of a series of webinars under the theme of rising to the challenge. What would it take to decarbonize transport? My name is Peter Jones. Um, I'm Professor of Transport and Sustainable Development in the Centre for Transport Studies at UCL, and I'll be chairing this morning's session. Um, we have a very tight schedule. We have 12 speakers this morning in, in just over two hours. Um, so I'll be very brief with my introduction um, and uh, I'll be very brief in introducing each of the individual speakers. If you have any questions or points you'd like to raise during this event, then please use the uh, question and answers function. The session will be recorded and I think you've all given permission for that as you come in. Um, and in fact, I'll move straight on now, uh, and I'd like to introduce Claire Haig, Claire Haig, who's Chief Executive of Greener Transport Solutions, to uh, frame and give the introduction to this event. Thank you, Claire. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. So good morning, everyone, and welcome to this um, first in a series of webinars that will culminate with the publication of a manifesto for decarbonising transport. My sincerest thanks to Adelshaw Goddard, who are kindly sponsoring these events, to the Foundation for Integrated Transport for providing grant funding to support the creation of the manifesto, and to the Greener Transport Council, who are overseeing this project, and without whose wise council, none of this would be possible. Let's start by acknowledging the scale of the challenge. It's clear that we are in last chance saloon. Even climate scientists are shocked by the accelerating changes. The latest IPCC report has been described as a code red for humanity. We are seeing severe weather impacts in areas not previously thought of as high risk. Nowhere is safe. The question is whether the policy response is commensurate to the scale of the challenge we face. Particular responsibility rests on UK shoulders. As host of COP26, we are uniquely placed to raise our own game and to show leadership. Concerns have been raised, however, that UK government policy is not living up to its rhetoric. Ambitious targets have been set without credible delivery plans. There is no coordinated cross-departmental strategy and there is a worrying lack of engagement with the public. Some two thirds of future emissions reductions will rely on individual choices and behaviors. Transport is a particular concern. Not only is it the biggest polluting sector of the UK economy, it is also the fastest growing source of global greenhouse gas emissions. Transport emissions in the UK are only 3% lower than they were in 1990. And aside from the sharp fall induced by the pandemic, emissions have actually increased since 2013, with vehicle efficiency gains being eroded by the trend to larger vehicles and rising demand for car and van travel. Government policy is heavily dependent on technology solutions with plans to phase out sales of all new polluting road vehicles by, 20, by 2040. However, we will still require a significant reduction in traffic on our roads. The Scottish government has pledged a 20% cut in car kilometers by 2030 but there is no mention of any such target in the transport decarbonisation plan. Moreover, if we electrify the fleet without replacing fuel duty, road traffic could increase by an additional 30% as the cost of running a car fall dramatically. The TDP makes clear that it wants public transport, walking and cycling to be the natural first choice. But it's not clear how this will be achieved. And the overriding message is that we will be able to continue our existing travel behavior just with cleaner technologies. In perpetuating the myth that we can continue our current lifestyles unchanged, government is storing up problems for the future. If government wants to take the public with it on this journey to net zero, it must first level with the public about some of the hard choices ahead. This is urgent. 60% of fuel supply and fully half of surface transport decarbonisation required by 2050 needs to have happened in this decade if we are to remain on track. The purpose of the Rising to the Challenge series is to focus attention 
on the policy changes required if we are to achieve net zero. We need to reduce car use, and that will involve improving access to public transport, walking and cycling. But more fundamentally, our whole economy needs to change. We need to reduce the need for travel. We need to ensure that every mode of transport is, is, is priced according to its environmental impact. It should be cheaper to use public transport than to drive or to fly, but too often that is not the case. The, the, the changes that we need are gonna, are gonna go way beyond what, what we've, what, anything that we've seen so far. There are some inherent policy challenges. Achieving net zero will require a more efficient use of a smaller vehicle fleet. However, growing the UK car manufacturing sector is a key plank in the government strategy to level up the country. Progress is also impeded by a lack of clarity about who should be doing what and where power should lie. The fragmented and disjointed nature of devolution means that too often local leaders are reliant on short-term project-based ad hoc funding and lack the power and resources to plan and invest on an integrated long-term basis. The freeze in fuel duty has been of benefit um, to low-income households, whilst increasing, who, who, without access to adequate public transport, whilst increasing traffic and CO2 emissions. What mitigation measures will be needed to make increasing fuel duty acceptable and prevent it from becoming a regressive tax hike? Crucially, the decarbonisation of transport cannot occur without changes to the wider economy. Digitalisation increasingly drives large parts of the economy and therefore the choices that we make about whether we even need to travel. However, our current system of regulation is designed precisely not to address the integration of transport into our digital world and the wider economy in a decarbonisation context. The siloed nature of government militates against the joined up approach needed if we are to ensure that new housing developments do not build in car dependency, what changes might we want to see in the planning bill? And the integration of transport with energy will be critical. Does the Office of Zero Emission Vehicles have the capacity, skills and remit to enable it to oversee, to oversee the fast paced transition implied by the 2030 target? And how will all of this be paid for? The investment needed to decarbonise transport will go significantly beyond what can be achieved from the fare box or the taxpayer. Alternative funding mechanisms such as land value capture will be needed. And how can we better harness private investment? These are just some of the questions that we will explore today in this first webinar in which we will discuss the need for a whole systems approach to transport decarbonisation. Thank you all very much for joining and I look forward to our discussion. Thank you very much, Claire. I think that sets out the scene and the challenges very, very clearly. And I'm now just delighted to introduce the Right Honourable Lord Deben, who is Chair of the Committee for Climate Change. And I can think of nobody better to actually uh, give us a, a broad context about the challenges and also the opportunities based not only his, on his current experience, but his history as well in, in the um, Secretary of State for Environment and many other important posts in government. So thank you very much for joining us today, Lord Deaton, and over to you, thank you. Well, thank you very much. And I much enjoyed Claire Hugh Haig's um, introduction because I think uh, there was nothing she said which I wouldn't agree with. Uh, I think one has to start off by saying that um, we do need to congratulate the government in taking on board the targets which it has. It has set a, an example to the rest of the world. It certainly has some very tough measurements which it has to meet and it has made those statutorily enforceable so that if it doesn't do it, the courts can intervene. Th that is a totally different position from that which many other countries have got. The problem is exactly what Claire says, which is that having fixed that, having set the example, 
it isn't credible unless there is a practical step-by-step clear indication of how the government is going to achieve those ends. And the Climate Change Committee is very clear about this, and that is why the sixth carbon budget is so important. It has now become uh, the law of the land. Uh, Parliament has passed it, and therefore we now do have a very clear um, direction, but not only a direction, precisely how we have what we have to achieve in each of the areas, including transport. Uh, the government has got to fill in the gaps, not in the sense that we haven't recommended what it does, but simply it's got to make some of those choices. It is for the democratically elected government to make those choices. But some choices, as Claire has said, some choices are obvious and necessary. And I think she's so right in saying that it is vitally important that the government creates the circumstances in which there is a proper discussion with the public, because otherwise uh, these things will come upon them unprepared, and preparation is a crucial part of that. So how should that be done? Well, first of all, it's got to prepare itself, because government is siloed to a degree which really does make it impossible for proper policies to be carried through. And I too would uh, say that we need in the planning bill, which we're promised, first of all, to have an overall planning assumption that all decisions will be made in the light of the government's statutory commitment to net zero in 2050 and to uh, a reduction by uh, 68% on 1990 by 2030. Now that's got to be in the bill and it's got to say that any planning decision you make, not just transport or infrastructure ones, but any planning decision you make has got to take that into account. And we've seen how important that is by the uh, difficulties which have arisen because the Cumbrian uh, County Council gave planning permission, it seemed, or at least started to, uh, to a, um, a coal mine. Now, if you actually look at the present planning laws, not only is there no reason why they shouldn't do that, it's very difficult to see that they could, under the circumstances, with the advice they have, make a different decision. There is no central planning advice from the Department of uh, uh, Local Government as to what are the um, arrangements that should be taken into account. The inspectors have no basic advice as to how that should be. And it seems to me that planning is the first step that you have to deal with if you're dealing with transport. Yes, you can do the mechanical things, you can say by 2030, and it's a very good and a remarkable thing that Grant Shapps has done. 2030, um, uh, electric vehicles or equivalent have got to be the only ones sold. But in between times, you've got to set up society so that it can handle that. And then you've also got to explain how you're going to make it possible for people to make the changes that are necessary. And uh, one thing that Claire did not mention is that if you do me move to much more electrification, you've really got to look at the system which delivers the electricity. And one of the things that worries me more than anything else is that the government talks about it in a way which is partial and bit by bit. We have to look at the system entirely as a whole because the problem with the present system is that it was built on the basis that you had large centrally directed generating centers and you push the electricity out from that. Indeed, the French word centrale always seems to me to be a, a useful word to think of. Now, that's not what's happening now. More and more of the electricity we have comes in from different directions. And yet we haven't really worked out how you even do that because uh, we have got the most cack handed, I called it dad's army way of linking up the offshore with the onshore. All those people who said we don't want it onshore, we want it offshore. It, what they didn't realize was that if you put it offshore, you still got to bring it onshore. And that's got to be a sensible system. 
So uh, I put as my second point that we really do have to have a, um, a, a systematization of the change of the electricity system. And of course, the motor car has therefore got to be, in that sense, both a storer of electricity and something that takes electricity. And, and to organize that, I have seen no policy and no program whatsoever to do that. And that means number three, which is that exactly as Claire said, it's not just about transport. If you want to get this right, it's about building new homes that accept the facts of electric transport and more walking and more um, uh, public transport. You've got to think of uh, construction in general as to be uh, controlled uh, in a way which makes sure that it does meet the needs of the future. And of course, the government has so far failed to bring into operation the Future Homes program and the uh, concomitant commercial buildings program. And so we have managed to build a million homes since they foolishly uh, got rid of the zero carbon homes policy in 2017, which was a disgrace. But having done that, we've built a million homes that have to be retrofitted. And, and that's a really serious issue and retrofitted not just for the home, but for the use of electric transport. So we really do have some major changes that have to be made now in, as Claire says, in the surrounding issues in order to, con before you can even concentrate on what you do about transport. Now I want to pick up number four is really to pick up the whole question of walking and cycling and the rest of it. This is a prize example of politicians. I think as an ex-politician, I'm allowed to do to say this. It's a prize example of politicians learning the language and not understanding the realities. And the point is they all talk about walking and cycling. None of them, well, none of them, very few of them do it. And, uh, and the fact of the matter is, as a nation, we do use our cars on shorter journeys than almost any other country. We seem to have forgotten that God has given us two feet and two legs, and that's what we're supposed to be using for most of the time. We live about a mile away from our local village, and it's extremely nice because that's as far as one really wants to walk there and back to dinner. And so one's friends who live in the road and such like along there is extremely good. But in a sense, we've had to relearn to do that because that's not how naturally people did. And one of the worries about electric cars, and I have an electric car and I'm very pleased with, once you've had one, you wouldn't have any other kind of vehicle. But of course, you mustn't get into the mood of saying, because it's an electric car, because I have electricity, which is all renewable, then I can use it in time in terms of when I shouldn't. Frankly, you've got to learn the lesson that we've got to walk more. It's much better for us. And we've also got to use public transport in a different way. Now, that brings me to number, uh, uh, number six. I think. The, the reality is that we haven't made the use of lockdown, which we should have made. And I really want to emphasize this. All these discussions by government about people going back to normality once we're through COVID is unacceptable. What COVID has, thank God, done for us is that we now can do what we're doing at this moment, which is actually to reach 152 people in a very convenient and uh, sensible way. I couldn't have found the time to go somewhere today because I'm in between two meetings in Suffolk and I've got to be in London by two o'clock because Parliament is now see, uh, meeting. Now, I think I can just about justify a proper meeting of Parliament because actually doing it by voting and such like distance, you, you don't get what you need to have in a parliamentary assembly. I can't think of many other things. You can certainly do committee meetings of Parliament by what we are doing. There's a whole lot of stuff that you can do. And the last thing we should be doing is encouraging people to go back five days a week, nine to five to their offices. 
what we should be doing is saying we've got to have a new mechanism of management. We've got to make it possible for people to work from home. We've got to understand that that means a different way of working. And we have to recognize, of course, that people have to work together. So you may have one or two day days which are compulsory, but the rest of it you work from home. I found in my businesses that people produce better we have higher productivity once you understood how to do these things. So I end really by bringing back to the two most important things. First, the government must be congratulated on its targets and attacked on the basis that it hasn't delivered the mechanisms for delivering those targets. We mustn't forget either of those, because unless you're grateful, people don't do what you want them to do. And I find sometimes the sort of con constant attacks from certain people. I know why they do it, but it isn't helpful. You do have to say to individual ministers and individual departments and indeed the prime minister, you have to say, thank goodness we're there. But in order to get further, we must have not only a detailed way of delivery, but we've also got to have a system which covers all the departments. It is a scandal that the Secretary of State for Education has made no series of speeches about how he is going to have a skilled training system so that we can be trained for the new green world. And the reason is that education doesn't see itself as an integral part of what we have to do to reach uh, net zero. And the second thing that it comes back to as well is that we have to have a new association with the public. We've got to have a partnership with local government. We've got to help local government to, to bring together all the organizations from the churches to the trades unions all the way through in their locality. And we've got to give them the power and the resources to deal with this. The great fact is that this is all going to cost us less than 1% of our gross national product every year. This is a perfectly doable thing. The problem is that that 1% is not spread evenly. It isn't spread for those who have most abilities and not. Most of it will be spent by the private sector. But the on effects of that, the effect of spending that money means that some people will have to spend more than they can afford. And government has got to have a program which genuinely enables climate change mitigation to be done justly. We have to have just transmission from one to the other. If we don't have that, people won't accept it and it will be wrong. And so I end with that point because we who are concerned about transport have to recognize that justice has got to be part of what we do. And if I hear any more nonsense about saying this is attacking the motorist, there is no such thing as the motorist. There are people who use a motor car for all sorts of different reasons. And we have to look at those and see how best to mitigate the problems and how also to encourage people to get back to walking and using public transport. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lord Dean. That was uh, very thought provoking and, and uh, it's good to have your wisdom distilled down into a few minutes. Perhaps I could make a comment. Um, you said, uh, you know, government is very siloed, but I think there are one or two encouraging things. For example, the NHS, which I'm sure you're aware, last December produced its net zero carbon report in which it identified that 15% of all its estate's carbon emissions actually came from passenger transport, whether it's employees or patients or visitors, and seemed to take some responsibility for dealing with that. So it's encouraging that the CBI has also encouraged its members to uh, take responsibility for the carbon resulting from their employees commuting. So at least outside central government, I think there are some encouraging signs. I wonder if I can ask you a quick question. Um, the, the DFT document very much starts off giving the impression that we can carry on life as normal, um, we just can do it in an electric way. Whereas a lot of commentators, and I, I think your committee as well, has actually said, you know, we will need to uh, get some transfer from cars. So effectively, we stop getting growth in, in car traffic and, and, if anything, a slight reduction on current levels in the future. Um, would you like to say anything more about that? Well, yes, I think that um, I think you're right about the assessment of the document. I, I don't attack it because it's got such good things in it that I don't really want to do that. But but I do have to say that uh, we've got, for example, to 
be really rather tough about the emerging, um, you must be able to order things that will be delivered within an hour or within a day. Frankly, uh, these vans that are traveling all around the place, this is a, a serious issue. It's the major reason for congestion in the city of London is delivery vans. And one really, has got to get away from the idea that we have a society where you you don't have to think ahead at all. All you have to do is to send off for Amazon to deliver for you next day, or now it seems within an hour if you want groceries. This is a terrible statement about human beings' inability to think forward. We've actually got to recognize that you have to have a system which is not going to do that. You have to have a much better logistic system so you reduce the, 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 the amount of travel that has to be done in any case, and you do it in a much more environmentally friendly way, but you recognize that we really mustn't get into a new world in which we don't shop except by people who deliver in wholly heterogeneous ways to us all the time. So I'm a great believer that, that and this is the moment to do it. We should be doing that now before these concepts become engendered and before very large uh, 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 companies, many of which are not paying their proper rate of taxation, if I may say so, uh, tell us what we should be doing. So we need to look at that very carefully. As far as the, um, uh, I, I think there is a problem in government. Government feels that if, that they can only get people to do things if you tell them that it'll end up by them being in exactly the same place, but actually doing it slightly differently. I think that's wrong. I think you have to be honest with people. They know it really. It's not going to be like that. We've got to find a whole range of things. It's not either or, it's both and. It's a whole series of things we have to do. And that's why the public discussion, uh, which the great um, uh, operation which we had when we did have a public discussion about climate change is how you have to do it. And I look to the government to try to do that. Thank you very much. Um, just reflecting on what you were saying, I, I think probably it's also perhaps about sort of high level goals that, that people can still live healthy lives, they can still live, live fulfilling lives, but in ways that involve less carbon. Yes. Yeah, I think Absolutely. that's what we're talking about, isn't it? Yeah. Um, Claire, did you want to make a quick comment? I, I saw you a very expressive reactions to Lord Deben. Would you like to make a quick comment? Well, no, just thank you very much, Lord Deben, for everything you had to say, and thank you very much for joining. I mean, no, it's really great to hear every, everything you had to say. And you're absolutely right that we, we do also need to applaud the government um, for setting targets and, and for setting out that vision. There is some great stuff in the transport decarbonisation plan. Absolutely, it's an exciting vision and they are world leading targets. So I just do, do want, want to say that. I think one thing that uh, you're absolutely right about freight and that's why it's so important in this session, we're looking at this whole systems and integrate, better integration of freight, logistics, transport, all, all of this is, is the sort of picture that we need to, to, to emerge. Um, now, something that we have, we're not probably going to focus on today, but will be very much uh, a subject for the next session is, is, is the issue of road pricing. Um, so we have, you know, that, that's going to be a, it'll probably be a big part of, of session two, but that will also apply to freight. So I think, I think having a system of how we can basically manage um, the, the volume of traffic on our roads in a more efficient way, that's where we need to get to. Um, and moving away from fuel duty is, is the moment to introduce a new system, which would be better anyway. I mean, that's something that we, that we, will, we will be talking about. I just wanted to add that in really at this point. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure that's right. Uh, yeah. And we've also got to ask ourselves a very question, big question about the road building program. There's mm -hmm. a very great deal of money there, uh, which should be used in other ways. It, uh, it, it really can't be true that if we're going to talk about a society which is bound to have fewer movements, which is what I'd prefer to put it in, and more efficient movements, then we really do have to ask ourselves about the road building program. And um, the, I always remember many, many years ago when the road building program really kicked off, um, the, uh, the, the, the Secretary of State for Transport, he was Minister for Transport at the time, said this is the biggest road building program since the Romans. I slightly believe that we now have to say this is the smallest 
road building programme, which we have had because we're going to use the money in ways that will be better for the motorist, this mythical being. In other words, for all the different people who use the roads, we've got to find better ways to enable them to do what they want to do, not in a manner which destroys our planet. Thank you very much indeed, Lord Deben, and I uh, hope you have a successful uh, trip up to London. Thank you. Uh, and thank you as well, Claire, for this session. So we'll now move on to the panel discussion. And indeed, one of our speakers we'll get to a little bit later on is Professor Alan McKinnon, uh, who will cover freight logistics. But first of all, I'd like to introduce David Brown, who's Chief Executive from Go Ahead, uh, to give us his thoughts. Thank you, David. Well, follow that, I suppose, is one thing I'd say. Well, thank, thanks for the invite. Uh, it's an important discussion, probably the biggest issue of our time. Uh, and tackling climate change and the systemic changes that need to go with it. So a, a few brief words about Go Ahead. We've embarked on our journey to becoming net zero by 2045. We've set out a plan that includes transitioning our fleets to net zero by 2035. Um, and we're pleased to have made a really good start on that journey. We're the biggest operator of electric buses in the UK. We're the first to have run a geofence extended range electric hybrid. Uh, which means it runs automatically on zero emission in Brighton's uh, clean air zone. We have the largest overnight charging depot at Northumberland Park in London, which we plan to become a virtual power station, picking up something that's already been said about cars storing and giving back energy. Um, so we'll be able to take the uh, energy from the buses and put it back into the grid. Elsewhere, we're starting to look at opportunity charging. Uh, again, in London, that's another issue that comes back into the... Um, the, the amount of use you can get out of the, the, the batteries at the moment. And shortly, I, about next year, uh, June next year, we'll be running a fleet of hydrogen buses out of Crawley. So we're, we're, we're on that plan. Um, but so there's a lot happening. Uh, and there's a long way to go. I feel I'm on message with saying this, but um, there's no shortage of ambition and targets, which is good. Uh, I, I, I do agree with what I've heard so far. You've got, you've got to applaud that. I think we are ahead of the game. Um, and there's no shortage of consultations and policy papers. There is a bit of a shortage of a plan, though, uh, and that is a little bit more vague about how we're actually going to get there. So we've done some of the work on how we as a company will get there uh, and what the transition of our fleet means. And by extrapolating those numbers across the whole of the UK's bus industry, we believe there's a funding gap of £522 million a year for the entire bus industry to have completely gone to zero emission fleet by the target date of 2035. I will repeat that. There's a, we need 522 million pounds every year for the next 14 years to reach the government's decarbonisation target for buses. That's not gonna happen. That is too big a number. Uh, it's not gonna happen. So what are, what are the ways that we can reduce that number? What are the other things that need to happen to get that number down to be more realistic? And one of the simplest ways that this can actually happen is to actually believe in public transport and believe in buses and believe in the very essence that public transport actually gives and to start switching people out of cars into public transport and active travel will achieve much, 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 much more. Uh, and that sort of seems to fill the theme of what I've, I've picked up on. So, I mean, just one of the facts that we've had for a long time, a bus will take 75 cars off the road. And the more customers we get, the more likely and the ability the companies have to invest back into the fleet. And one of the things that's, again, you know, it's been said, but electric cars, hydrogen buses, um, electric buses, I should say, and hydrogen buses do not of themselves attract more customers. That is not why people will travel by bus. Um, that's just a, that's a sideshow to what's going on. It's about frequency, journey time, and accessibility. A 10% reduction in journey times will add 10% uh, more customers. If we can get those more customers, we can do more investment. And these are the sorts of things that I'm hoping will come out of the national bus strategy. We've talked about some of this in, in national bus strategy. It's about getting to a virtuous circle of more customers leading to more investment. So how do we get frequency and journey times? It's, it's not too difficult. And it's about investing in speeding up journey times through bus priority measures, simple traffic light priorities, bus lanes, simple curb alignments, and making Green BSOG a re reality. So again, on the theme of commending something good, we've got Green BSOG coming in. I'd like it a little bit more on the Scottish rates. That would be quite nicer. 
Um, but that's all part of creating a business case for private companies to actually invest in electric vehicles. But there's a, there's a contrary side to all of this. The other contrary side is not doing the things that give the car the built-in advantage, the current free ride that it actually gets. So the fiscal policy on fuel duty has to change. Free car parking in city centres has to change. Direct access to city centres has to change. Things have to be just that little bit more difficult and not so easy for using a car. And as the population transitions to electric cars, uh, we don't really want electric car congestion. We've got to also remember there's an upstream cost and the pollution cost for some of those moves. And we also got to recognise that some of that will lead to a less tax take by the government. So uh, Claire's already just said that that could come into uh, tomorrow's discussions. I didn't know that. But I mean, will this lead to road pricing? Will finally road pricing, which seems to have been talked about for a large part of my career, actually become a realistic solution? As government needs revenue to replace what they're losing out of uh, the move to electric vehicles, do we finally get to a point where the polluter pays principle or the pure economic theory of someone actually paying for the scarce resource that they're using, i.e. traffic free roads? And on top of all of this, in terms of systemic changes, we need innovations. We need lighter batteries. We need longer range batteries. We need a vibrant market which will accelerate such solutions. But we can't be fooled into thinking that doing this and having that market will just automatically bring the prices down. My estimation is that that isn't going to happen for some time. So in summary, we all want to do and go ahead are doing their bit for decarbonisation. There is currently no business case to just invest in electric vehicles in the current circumstances. It therefore requires government funding or dramatic shifts to bus use led by the bus, national bus strategy and changes to both infrastructure and tax funding, which uh, generates a virtuous circle of more customers leading to more investment, plus a bit of good innovation thrown in for good measure. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, David. Um, so uh, Lord Deven referred to public transport and also referred to freight and logistics. So I'll now hand on straight away to Professor Anne McKinnon, who is Professor of Logistics at Kearney Logistics University in Hamburg. Thank you very much. Alan. Uh, thank you, Peter. Um, as I'm a logistics professor, I'm going to confine my comments really to freight transport. Um, I think I'm right in saying I did the first carbon footprint of freight transport in the UK way back in 2007. Um, to try to repeat that today would be very difficult because the freight transport system has become very fuzzy at the edges uh, where it interfaces with personal travel um, on the last mile. Um, as as uh, um, Lord Deben uh, said, I mean, we've seen an explosive growth of online retailing and, and with it a big increase in the use of vans, courier cars, cargo cycles to deliver products. Um, and we lack the data really to properly carbon footprint that. Um, if one looks at the transportation uh, decarbonizing transport document of the government, uh, they say that they will be taking forward measures to transform last mile logistics, but it doesn't give any indication as to what it's going to be, what it's going to be doing. And what we need actually to do is, as academic researchers is to break down the traditional silos that we've had between freight and passenger transport really to analyze the subject. But leaving last mile to one side, I mean, to what extent are we currently decarbonizing long haul freight movements in the UK? Um, I, I'd like to try and answer that question with respect to what we call the five lever approach to decarbonizing freight transport. And the first lever um, is just to reduce the demand for freight transport. Um, now, this may come as a surprise to some people, but there has actually been a, a 4% reduction in the total amount of uh, freight ton kilometres in the UK between 2011 and 2019. Um, th that trend, I think, could go further. I mean, there are other things that we could be doing to reduce the freight transport in intensity of the, the UK economy. Uh, the second lever is um, shifting as much freight as possible to lower carbon transport modes. Uh, unfortunately, that trend's been going in the wrong direction, but the, for the right reasons in terms of climate change, uh, because the, the railways have lost their coal traffic, you know, as, as we change power generation uh, away from, from coal, uh, the, the, there's been a 95% reduction in the amount of coal carried by the railways um, since 2013. Uh, which, the challenge for the railways, however, will be to replace that coal traffic with other commodities. Um, in the trans decarbonizing transport document, the government said it's going to come up with a, a target um, for rail freight traffic. Um, I would prefer it to come up with a modal shift target, um, but uh, as that, that is yet to happen. The third lever is to make better use of freight capacity. 
um, according to government data. Uh, th there's a mixed picture on this. Uh, so the proportion of lorry kilometres run empty has been increasing in recent years. It reached, reached 30% in 2019. But on the other hand, the um, average load factor on trucks has been gradually improving. Um, again, a big disappointment for me is that the decarbonising transport document says virtually nothing about how we improve the utilisation of freight capacity, despite the fact that this allows us to cut carbon emissions in the short to medium term and has very low or even negative carbon mitigation costs. And also um, digitalization, it seems to me, offers huge potential for filling the vehicles better. And I detect a strong willingness by companies these days to increasingly share uh, vehicle capacity. Um, my uh, fourth uh, lever is improving the energy efficiency of freight transport. Um, again, if one looks at the government data on this up to 2016, which is the last year for which we've got data, um, the average fuel efficiency of articulated vehicles in the UK has not been changing. It's been pretty flat now for many years. And in the case of rigid vehicles, it's actually been declining. Um, so we need to do more to improve the energy efficiency in this sector. But one thing that will help post-Brexit is that we will still benefit from the EU's fuel economy standards for trucks, for new trucks, um, but there again, it's going to take time for that really to, to transform the current vehicle fleet. And the fifth lever um, is defossilizing the energy that we use in the freight sector. Um, in the case of the railways, uh, what that I think will involve is plugging the gaps in the electrified rail freight network, um, which would be a relatively cost effective way of decarbonizing rail freight operations. And in the case of road freight, um, it's going to be the use of batteries, it seems to me, um, supplemented, I think, by some highway electrification, and I know there's a trial about to begin on that, um, and also using hydrogen uh, fuel cells as a range extender uh, as well. But as, as Lord Deben said, I mean, that is going to create a huge demand for low carbon electricity, and, and we, we're very dependent on uh, electricity decarbonisation for that purpose. But, but that fifth lever is a longer term one. That is a 15 to 25 year, 15 to 20 year time frame um, to, to make the freight system low carbon by electrification. And, and probably my, my biggest disappointment in reading the government's transport decarbonisation document is as far as the freight content is concerned, it lacks a sense of urgency. It's pinning its hopes on that fifth lever and overlooking the potential for decarbonisation from the second, third and fourth levers, uh, which will offer um, uh, in, in the short term significant carbon savings. Um, I, I, as far as freight is concerned, my feeling is there's a lot of procrastination by consultation, kicking the ball into the long grass and saying we have still to debate. We already know a huge amount about how we decarbonise freight transport. Uh, the government should know this because there have been major studies done in the UK in recent years by the National Infrastructure Commission, by the Foresight Programme, by the Committee on Climate Change. There's a high level of knowledge. We just need to get on with it. And that's my key message. Thank you, Peter. Thank you very much, Alan. Thank you. So I'll move straight on to Professor John Whitelake, who's Senior Fellow at the Foundation for Integrated Transport, who has been championing sustainability and decarbonisation for a very long time. So I look forward to hearing your views, John. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to be able to take part in, in this discussion. I think my main contribution is probably well known to everyone, but it, it's, it's an argument based on my experience of working in Germany that we need to make a, a, a large shift ourselves from talking about the things I've talked about for 30 years, which is the detail of walking and cycling and buses and trains and coordination and integration and upgrade the, the whole discussion to identify major structural transformational issues, uh, policy suggestions, fundings, that have the potential to shift everything that we want to shift in what I think is the agreed direction, which is something approaching total decarbonisation of transport. And uh, this major transformation in, in outside of Britain is not unusual. Um, uh, my German colleagues work intensively on and my German's appalling, by the way, any give vendor, mobilitate vendor, the cares vendor, major transformations in energy and mobility and transport. And uh, we need to do something similar. But let me give an example. Uh, if we do want to uh, uh, upgrade our walking and cycling rates, 
reduce car use, especially for short journeys, as Lloyd Deben was uh, emphasizing, and I was pleased to hear that. Then what we need to do is a couple of fairly obvious things. We need, for example, to adopt the Swedish approach, Vision Zero. There will be a total revolution transformation of road safety. No one will be killed or seriously injured in the road traffic environment. And a total system-wide approach to that, vehicle manufacturing, policing, um, how, how you learn to drive, uh, how you intervene to deal with uh, breaches of the regulations. Um, I have a letter from the Department of Transport telling me that we do not agree with Vision Zero. It is not appropriate. There is no evidence that it works. The fact that it was introduced in Sweden by the Swedish parliament in 1997 and works perfectly well, I've just returned from working in Sweden for 11 months, it's a delight to live in a country where Vision Zero operates. So uh, that will boost walking and cycling, and, and yet we reject it. On public transport, there are many similar examples. If we do want to improve uh, levels of bus use, which I certainly do, then we need to start thinking much bigger and wider. So why don't we adopt, for example, uh, the, re the recommendations of the recent report from CPRE, one bus every hour, every village? Why don't we adopt pulse timetabling as in Switzerland? Why don't we adopt the system that I used several times a week in my rural Swedish retreat, where I only had a choice of 26 bus every day in a deeply rural area a weekday and that went down to a dreadful 10 on a Saturday and Sunday uh, every bus integrated with every train station I could travel for 75 minutes for three pounds on any bus any train within that radius why don't we have regional transport authorities why don't we coordinate why don't we integrate why don't we link that to traffic reduction why don't we link it to car free towns and cities there's so much potential for upgrading our thinking to a more structural system-wide uh, intensive application of our ideas so that we change the whole context within which transport decisions and spending are made. And, and that is certainly possible. And that leads to some major changes which are not on the agenda of the UK government or the English government. So for example, um, we need to cancel the whole road building programme. The whole 27 billion on RIS2, the whole 7 billion on what's called LLM, lo local roads. There's a lot of money available for uh, spending on zero carbon transport, boosting all the alternatives, in, in my many blogs on the Foundation for Integrated Transport website, I argue that all these alternatives more than deliver on the government's own objectives. We can reduce carbon, we can reduce congestion, we can improve public health. Why don't we adopt the World Health Organization standards for increasing levels of physical activity? We claim to support higher levels of physical activity, but all the recommendations in the World Health Organization, GAPA, uh, Global Action Plan on Physical Activity, have not been accepted and not been implemented by the UK government. Why not? Why do we not engage with economic and fiscal intelligence and responsibility? All these sustainable transport uh, ideas, suggestions, policy proposals are, I don't like the word cheap, uh, are cheaper than the way we currently run transport and mobility. We have proper, robust, scientific, empirical evidence that if you want to do something that's destructive and dangerous and expensive, you do what we now do in Britain. And if you want to do something that works much better and promotes public health and reduces carbon and reduces air pollution and reduces congestion, then you cancel the road building program you invest in all the zero carbon alternatives, you have car free cities, you have car free towns, you have vision zero. So we have available to us a wide range of interventions which are much deeper, much wide, wider, system wide interventions in the way that we all want to see progress made. And that's what I want to see. And the Germans have got it uh, sussed with their terminology. We don't have anything, I think, like the cares vendor. Uh, a total transformation of mobility, uh, of transport and mobility. So I want to argue, and, and I, I've written about this, but the, there isn't time to bore you all with it now, that we need to upgrade our own thinking, our own language, our own interventions. So rather than me spending another 30 years talking about why we need new cycle paths, uh, for example, we need to talk about just do vision zero and just do all these other things that are in the Vickers vendor list of, of, of uh, suggestions and get the total total system-wide conditions more conducive to zero carbon. Um, I can return to that later, but that's enough for now, I think. Perfect timing. Thank you very much indeed, John. Thank you. And I'll move straight on to Johnny Mood, who's Director of Value for Money in the National Audit Office. Thank you very much, Johnny. Thank you, Peter. 
Uh, for those of you unfamiliar with the National Law Office, we are the UK's independent public spending watchdog. Um, we support Parliament in holding government to account through our financial audit work and our value for money reports. Uh, we produce about 60 of those a year and we're independent of government and the civil service. Um, we've actually published a number of reports on government's efforts to decarbonise, looking at various different aspects. We've examined government's plans for achieving net zero as a whole, as well as particular aspects such as ultra low emission cars, local government and net zero, environmental tax measures, measures and bus services, cycling and walking. So what's that work taught us about the specific challenges facing transport and government in their bid to decarbonise? Well, there are five emerging themes from our work, which I'm going to try and rattle through in my five minute allotted time. First, government needs to ensure sufficient and sustainable resourcing is provided for decarbonizing activities, and that these are given priority against other competing demands. That applies at a central and local government level. Uh, so we've reported regularly on local authority finances where there have been financial pressures for a number of years leading to a focus on statutory duties with limited scope for engagement with other strategic goals such as net zero. Spending reviews also will be an important part of long term planning for net zero activities as they allocate funding for multiple years across government. When government's thinking about the projects and programmes it chooses to fund, we think full consideration should be given to the carbon emissions associated with each one alongside other environmental impacts and looking at that in the round. Secondly, government must be aware of and manage the links between different activities associated with decarbonisation. So at that strategic level, the interdependencies of activities need to be managed to ensure that activities in one area do not undermine or have unintended consequences in another area of government. For example, I think this has been mentioned already, the drive to electrify road vehicles and rail travel will increase demand for electricity from the grid. However, responsibility for power and energy provision and grid connection costs sits outside of the Department for Transport. And addressing those kind of cross-government working issues um, has been an issue that we've identified in our work across government over a number of years, highlighting a number of factors which can limit the effectiveness of cross-government working, such as fragmented accountabilities, inconsistent messaging between departments, and a lack of measurable objectives which make it difficult to monitor outcomes. One example of point two is a disconnect between transport planning and new housing developments where too often public transport, walking and cycling infrastructure, as well as electric charging points, are added as an afterthought or not at all constraining the ability of those who live there to travel in a sustainable way and embedding a reliance on cars. Third, um, all organisations across the public sector, of course, have a part to play in supporting the transition to net zero. But what we've seen is that government's often been too slow to set out the roles and responsibilities for organisations outside of central government, as well as at a local level. For transport, a number of bodies will be fundamental to supporting the transition. For example, network rail will be significant uh, in helping decarbonise the railway and address the challenges that brings. And Highways England needs to ensure the strategic road network is prepared to support electric and hydrogen vehicles. At local level, local authorities are going to play a key role in supporting that transition and investing in walking and cycling. But as we reported earlier this year, the Department for Transport and other government departments have not clearly outlined the responsibilities and accountabilities for local authorities. And that's the kind of thing that can undermine success and confidence to embark on long term investments to decarbonise at a local level. Fourth, Government needs to have ways to measure its progress towards achieving net zero and its wider environmental goals. It reports annually on greenhouse gas emissions, giving a clear indication of overall progress towards net zero. But it's currently missing more detailed measures of progress across its policies, which would help identify for senior decision makers where the biggest delivery risks lie. And finally, a central challenge for government to achieve net zero is successfully engaging members of the public. And this, be, this has been mentioned previously. The, uh, the majority of carbon emission reduction achieved in the country so far has been through changes to how electricity is generated, which most people will not have noticed. The next phase of decarbonisation will see individuals needing to take actions themselves, such as purchasing an electric vehicle, replacing their boiler or something greener. And what we found in the past looking at government uh, policy uh, implementation is that government has often overestimated the likelihood of people engaging with policies. And there's an evidence of a mismatch between public support for action and the level of understanding of what action they will need to take individually. So we know the government's established a public engagement team and plans to publish an engagement strategy later this year. But it's really important that through that strategy, it tailors its engagement to different audiences and considers how changes to achieve net zero could impact people in different ways. That's a quick rattle through five of the overarching themes from our work to date uh, that we think government could consider in adopting that more joined up approach. Thank you, Peter.
Thanks very much, John. Um, and uh, our fifth speaker is, is Lauren Pammert, who's Programme Director in Green Finance Institute. Um, other speakers have talked about the need for investment, so we look hearing, forward to hearing your thoughts about that, Lauren. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank, and thanks very much for having me today. So the transition to zero emission transport is essential to reducing the UK's greenhouse gas emissions and fundamental to tackling climate change. Mm -hmm. As everyone else has already said very passionately, simply finding solutions for swapping internal combustion engines with electric vehicles won't meet all the challenges. If we want to reduce congestion and reduce air pollution resulting from particulates, then we're going to need fewer vehicles on the roads, being more efficiently used, more public transport usage, more virtual meetings, greener logistics patterns, and a significant increase in people walking and cycling for short journeys. So considering mobility with a system-wide approach is required if we're to achieve the UK's net zero goals. And failure to do this can lead to some unintended consequences. As David from Go Ahead said, for example, free electric vehicle parking in city centres can encourage EV adoption in a local area, but it disincentivizes public transport, increasing congestion and therefore air pollution. So decarbonising road transport is a challenge that's too large and interconnected for any one part of the market to solve alone. At the Green Finance Institute, we've recently launched a coalition for the decarbonisation of road transport, which brings together global experts from financial services, together with industry, academia, local and national government and civil society, to focus on unlocking the barriers to the mass adoption of electric vehicles and the associated infrastructure. Initially focused on passenger vehicles, simply due to resource, our aim is to launch new innovative financial solutions that have been co-designed with our coalition members, to enable the systemic change that will accelerate the transition. With just nine years left until the new uh, petrol and diesel cars can't be sold, the pace of the transition has to accelerate. And without intervention, this already ambitious target could be missed. The societal benefits of decarbonisation are clear, but our research has also shown that public and private finance have a critical role to play in the transition, with the opportunity to create skilled jobs and increase investment across the whole automotive supply chain. Our analysis estimates that more than 150 billion of gross capital investment may be required to decarbonise the UK road transport sector between now and 2030. But that's not one lump sum of cash. It's a complex range of different investment opportunities and financial mechanisms across a number of different asset classes with varying risk and reward characteristics that will appeal to different investors. Whilst public capital has a role to play, it's clear we need private capital being invested at scale into green transport. Left to the private market alone, the required investment won't happen quickly enough, as private capital can't price in the vast societal benefits of the transition. Taking EV charging infrastructure as an example, finance will play a major role in ensuring a strategic and well-connected EV charging network is established. Deploying private capital is a particular challenge given the niche aspects of charging infrastructure, ranging from rural individual charge points to rapid charging hubs, which have very different risk and return profiles. Market intervention and a system-wide solution is required to ensure charge points are installed in the correct locations, requiring collaboration between local authorities, data experts, energy, communication and infrastructure. The UK already has more than 25,000 charge points. We are seeing uneven distribution across the UK, which ultimately risks slowing the transition to electric mobility. Without a systems-wide approach, we risk seeing a race to install charge points in today's profitable locations, leaving sections of the UK population underserved. And this can't be allowed to happen if we're to make a successful transition to EVs feasible for the entire UK population. Without understanding the future landscape and the use case for zero emission vehicles of all asset classes, we also risk not future-proofing today's infrastructure. In our research, technology obsolescence and the risk of stranded assets were cited as barriers for institutional investors and why there may be a role for public capital to de-risk this longer term investment in the short term. A systems approach, considering future transport patterns and digital connectivity, can ensure that public capital is used as efficiently as possible. For example, by focusing grant-based funding in areas where private capital has less scope to be involved, and by using catalytic de-risking vehicles where the scope to build scalable investment opportunities exists. As we sit here today, the need for innovation and pragmatic financial solutions, urgency and collective effort has never been clearer. Collaboration between private and public sector is the only way that will mobilise the vast sums of money required to catalyse investment in a green transport ecosystem, helping to make the UK a world leader in zero emission mobility. Thank you. 
Thank you very much indeed, Lauren. And I'd like to thank all five speakers. Um, I really hope uh, we'll get a chance to, to hear what you've said and be able to reflect on it afterwards. A lot of great wisdom there and the experience uh, that we've been able to bring together today. So thank you all very much indeed. We're gonna move straight on now to um, our second uh, part of the morning, which is really a reflection debate. Um, and in that, uh, first of all, five members from the Green Transport Council, Green and Transport will be asked to briefly give their thoughts um, and then we'll open up for wider discussion and debate. So first of all, um, as you'll see, uh, Paul, has, uh, Paul Hurst has switched on his camera. He's head of the Transport Sector Group at Adelshaw Goddard, uh, who've helped to sponsor this event. Thank you very much, Paul. Thanks, Peter. And, and yeah, just to add my thanks to the speakers, it's been massively thought provoking so far, uh, really fascinating. And, you know, it's really clear that we're talking about transformational change. Claire made that point early on. And I must admit, I'm worried about politics getting in the way of some of the difficult decisions that we hear need to be made. And Alan McKinnon talked about the need for urgency, and I, I really agree with that. And it seems obvious to me that, you know, we have to manage demand for car use and we have to encourage modal shift to greener transport options. But we're in the midst of a car led recovery, and this is the problem. Trains are half empty, roads are already, you know, pretty much jam packed. But we have a once in a lifetime opportunity as people emerge from the pandemic, having seen the benefits of reduced emissions, reduced congestion, and I think are probably more amenable, therefore, to the sorts of changes that the panels have talked about so far. And I, and I go back to Lord Deben's comments about that, that really we need to, the government needs to be, needs to be bold and start that conversation with, with the public about the changes that need to be made to prepare them so that they're, so therefore you can get some of the changes that we need through more easily. Um, and it's clear to me that, you know, what we need is an integrated transport system uh, that's green and people talked about socially equ equitable, that it needs to be just, and it's gonna generate growth and jobs to enable places to flourish. And when I think about that, I've really got a couple of points to make. The first is, you know, when you think about places, city regions, uh, towns, rural communities, that integrator role, the bringing together of all the modes of transport available can only really be played by the local authorities because um, they've got a remit across not just the transport, but also, of course, transport being a derived activity. They've got a remit across housing, growth, jobs and education. But actually, at the moment, do they have the means to really take forward their vision and their plans that would encompass the green recovery? And I really question that. The, the TDP that we've heard about already talks about um, there being no uniform approach to decarbonisation, and I agree with that. And it talks about reforming or at least looking at the way that infrastructure schemes are going to be funded at a local level. And I really hope that in doing that, what we see coming forward is a clearer funding stream to enable local authorities to take forward these integrated plans and kickstart the recovery that we need to see. And just one final point, and I mentioned to Claire, I'd, I'd talk about private finance because you know, frankly, it's public money enough. And, and David made a fantastic point about the funding gap. Clearly, it isn't. But are we doing enough, actually, to harness private sector investment and third party investment? That won't just happen. You know, there is there is a lot of money available. It's out there. Third party finances are interested in, in funding assets, but you can't take it for granted. And I think they've been left out in the cold. I worry because we've looked at it in the context of rail infrastructure and it hasn't got off the ground. But, you know, if you talk about buses, bus are so important to the recovery. Uh, and, you know, all local authorities pretty much have got an obligation or a policy direction to go for greener bus buses. You know, they need zero emission fleets. That seems like a perfect opportunity to work more closely with the private sector, potentially to work out how to get a flight path that's accelerated beyond the government, what the government can fund. But again, that won't happen overnight. You've got to create the conditions, I think, that encourage third party financiers to have better conversations with local authorities to work out what should that risk model look like? How can that help deliver the objectives that the local authorities have got? Not just providing the cash, but also working together in partnership to deliver what's needed. And I think that there's, there's a lot of opportunity there, but it does need more, I think, joint working between the public and private sector to deliver it. So that would, that would be my, my first point, but fascinating conversation so far. And it's great to be a part of it. Thank you. Thanks very much, Paul. Um, and next, inviting Professor Glenn Lyons, who's not Donald Professor of Future Mobility at the University of West of England, to give us his thoughts. Thanks very much, Glenn. 
Thanks, Peter. Uh, well, fascinating discussion so far. Um, and thank goodness we're recording it because there's just such a, a rich and complex list of things that we might, could, should or will do uh, in tackling this uh, unprecedented problem. Uh, and listening to the speaker so far, I guess my first remark is to be reminded of the famous Yes Minister episode, Bed of Nails, which uh, I'll also remind you is nearly 40 years old. Uh, so while Paul has called for an integrated transport system, um, the idea that we'll have a, a supremo for the integrated decarbonisation strategy um, may, much as we, we seek it, be, be a little far-fetched. I think what the presentations have really highlighted this morning um, is that we're needing to make multiple regime transitions uh, over the course of the next decade, the next decades, um, in the face also of multiple wicked problems. Uh, and each of those regime transitions needs to happen against time as the enemy, um, and they will create unintended consequences. And when you bring them all together, hence we have this very complex uh, and indeed wicked picture. So Lord Deben's quite right to, to highlight the importance of of systems thinking, uh, notwithstanding the bed of nails. Uh, and I think in, in terms of positives about the transport decarbonisation plan, um, it does indeed attempt to give us the big picture, at least within the transport sector. Uh, and I think whilst we can level criticism at it, as, as I and others have done, we should also applaud it um, for at least allowing us to have something of a helicopter view. Um, but within that, uh, a quick keyword search will highlight that there are 200 instances of saying we will. Um, so there's plenty of intention uh, and there's 100 instances of the word consult. So intention and consultation uh, against an impossible timescale seems rather worrying. Uh, and Lord Deben pointed out we need mechanisms to deliver. Well, there are, of course, mechanisms to deliver within the transport decarbonisation plan, but they focus primarily uh, on technology fix. And I don't think we should be under any illusion that technology fix itself still involves behaviour change, changes in the behaviour of industry, government and consumers. Now, just this morning, before we came on air, as it were, um, the SMMT released um, the latest news about new car registrations. Uh, if you've not seen it, you may be interested to know that car registrations for the year so far, 2021, are down on 25% down on the 10 year average. Uh, and they comment that this is attributed to wide ranging impacts of the pandemic on the automobile sector. And I think what it highlights is an important dynamic or one of many dynamics. Uh, and again, Lord Deben quite rightly highlighted that we must make the most of what the pandemic has shone a light on. There are significant dynamics in terms of the transport sector. And indeed it reaches beyond transport because it's really about how we go about reaching people, goods, services, jobs and opportunities in our daily lives uh, and the notion of a triple access system uh, where it's not just physical mobility, it's spatial proximity and digital connectivity. And perhaps it's an issue of privilege, but many of us have had the opportunity to do more living local and acting global in our lives of late. Um, an International Transport Forum report was published last month, which was looking at the trend breaks in behavior that have been created or exacerbated by COVID. Uh, and as part of contributing to that report, I took a look at some World Bank data across a number of countries to highlight the decoupling, which many people are aware of, between motor traffic uh, and economic output. And that decoupling is very clear across a number of OECD countries. Uh, and it's happening or has been happening concurrently with internet use. Um, I have my first physical journey for work tomorrow um, to London for 18 months. And I have to say, I'm not overly enthused about the idea because it feels as though there'll be something of a slipping back to the old ways of doing. Uh, and I suppose a note of defiance is me wearing um, the non-conformist uniform this morning because I desperately hope uh, that we will recognize that all of us, politicians and the public, uh, have been in a global experiment for the last 18 months. We've been exposed to the fact that we do live in this triple access system. And what that's doing is providing digital connectivity and spatial proximity, and we've seen that surge uh, in the appeal of active travel, reminding us that there are real alternatives to the motor car and indeed to motorised transport. Uh, so when in the past we've considered difficult policy measures that may be politically and publicly unpalatable, it's been in the context perhaps of more limited choice. But I really believe now, uh, in some respects, thanks to this awful pandemic, that we see now much greater prospect that behaviour change is possible 
uh, and change, as we've been hearing this morning, beyond just trip making, but exercising our needs for access to support economic prosperity and social well-being um, through other means besides. Thanks, Peter. Thanks very much, Glenn. Uh, so now straight on to Professor Greg Marston, who's Professor of Transport Governance at the Institute for Transport Studies at University of Leeds. Over to you, Greg. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Peter. It becomes increasingly difficult to say something uh, new as you get to the end of a very well-informed set of um, speakers. But um, I guess my reflection is we're in um, a world now of um, people writing strategies about what, um, what must happen, what must be true over the next 20 years. Um, when we look back, uh, as Claire pointed out, over the last 30 years, we've made um, 3 to 4% reduction in, in CO2 emissions. If you look at all the spending promises which we've got um, out at the moment, and let's be fair to government, uh, you know, during the pandemic, they still committed additional resources to transport. It actually doesn't take us back to the level of funding we had for local transport in the late uh, 1990s. So um, we get attracted to the big numbers that come with competition funding and so on, but actually the core funding has been cut over an extended period of time. So it doesn't feel like a, a transitional uh, rapid transition kind of uh, spend position um, and as has been pointed out we're making it um, cheaper to travel uh, whilst we're, we're saying uh, all of the strategies are saying we'll have more public transport so the, the whole electrification agenda you know I think that just just sits in the background to, to, to um, the reality of any of the strategies which are which are put out there uh, Ofgem released yesterday, a, I think it was a, um, a paper consulting on lower costs if you're, um, for your fuel if you're, if you're smart charging. So suddenly your, your vehicle becomes an asset at the same time that we're saying we want people to have fewer of them. But actually, it would, you're probably doing yourself a favour if, you, if you've got one uh, that you can plug into the grid. So um, I agree with Lord Deben that we, um, we've got ambitions, but we haven't got plans which are consistent um, with what has to happen. Um, in my local uh, area, Leeds, uh, they've published a very ambitious transport strategy. They're certainly the, the most interesting one in the 20 years that I've been here. Um, it's got a kitchen sink of policies. Well, not quite, it doesn't have charging uh, in it, but it gets us to a 42% reduction in CO2 emissions by 2030. Their goal is, is 100%. Um, and so it, it's really difficult to see that they can actually deliver all of the things that are in that plan within 10 years with the resources that they have available, but it still doesn't get us as far as we need to go. So what are we going to do? Where are we going to go for, uh, for more? Um, so I think there are a number of different um, places we can, we can look at and have to look at. We can't expect this to be solved only in the, in, in the public uh, sector, as has been said. I think the private sector is is critical and um, so the activities we take part in uh, as well as the vehicles that we use is where we have to focus so um, this notion of kind of post-covid uh, readjustment of businesses but businesses and what they require of their workers and of the commute has absolutely got to be central it's something we can do quickly um, traffic isn't yet back up to 100 percent of its its weekday um, uh, pre-pandemic levels we need to drive uh, further on that but I think we also have to turn beyond the commute to leisure and we have to think about how we get collective access to uh, leisure facilities these are businesses businesses need people to visit them but people are going to have to visit them in a different way and businesses need to take some of the responsibility for that working in, in partnership and those are things that I do think we can do quickly I think in terms of um, the, the, the public sector well, actually, engagement, um, I think, I think um, we haven't had those conversations, as was said, about what we need to do. So this doesn't necessarily deliver, deliver us anything particularly quickly, but there are lots of um, community groups. I noticed Kate Pangborn in the chat said, what about the kind of bottom-up groups? Let's look for the innovation that's out there and the ideas that are there in communities, get those done quickly. I'll just say there is no mention of the words fairness and justice in the transport decarbonisation plan. And if we don't have these discussions with, with members of the general public, then when it comes to the tough choices, we'll be at uh, first base still. Uh, and then finally, I suppose a reflection on, on, on government and governance, which is, which is the title of the, the chair that I hold. Um, this is a session on the whole system approach. Um, government changes really slowly. Um, what we need, if we're going to accelerate um, coordination on these difficult cross-cutting issues, I think actually it's best done by task and finish units. 
driven by the cabinet office. I think the social exclusion unit was a good example of something that could make a difference quite quickly. As soon as that passed down back into departmental hands, it went into the same usual cross departmental wrangling. So actually where we've got cross sectoral issues that need to be um, developed and delivered on, let, let's get those units set up uh, and get those problems dealt with quickly. If it is an emergency, then we need to you know, really change things quickly. So thanks, Peter. Thanks very much, Greg. Um, and our fourth um, council member to speak is Paul Campion, now Chief Executive TRL, formerly um, Head of Transport Catapults. Over to you, Paul. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Um, what a privilege to uh, uh, be on such an incredibly impressive uh, uh, event. And um, what a challenge to think of uh, something useful to say after all these contributions. Uh, Almost every person who's spoken has uh, said uh, five or ten things that I strongly agree with and would love to expand um, over a cup of coffee. Um, but I'm sure we've all felt uh, that everyone said something which has made us go, yes, but, or perhaps more positively, yes, and. Uh, my reflection is there's just no shortage of ideas. We've, we've heard really uh, expert thoughtful contributions across a whole range of transport. What it boils up to, doesn't it, is a restructuring of society, uh, which is the ultimate systems of systems. And transport is so bound up with every aspect of every person's involvement in the economic, social, political life uh, of the country in which they live that, that perhaps it's necessarily so. If I would say there's one common frustration that I hear, it's, it's the coordination. How do we make sure that everything adds up to the outcome we want? Let's put that another way. It's about prioritization as well, isn't it? There's, there's a, a system of questions uh, uh, being posted by the, uh, uh, the participants in the event as well. Everyone wants to have a common set of priorities. I'm sure that, I generalize horribly, you know, 15 panelists, 138 attendees, that uh, over 150 people who probably all feel that at some level or other, this is the priority, the non-negotiable challenge that we have to rise to at the moment. And yet, and yet, we see that things are not being done fast enough, this is not being treated as the climate crisis which it is called. So what are we going to do about it? I actually don't think we any, need any new ideas. I think that what we've heard are solutions or parcel solutions, or at the very least ideas for purposeful positive action that will make a change right across the whole spectrum here. So we don't need new ideas. What we need are new stories. What we've got to do is to help everyone to move more quickly, to understand a different set of priorities, to approach the challenges of prioritization, of conflicting, uh, 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 conflicting objectives with a common view of what the single most important and urgent thing is which is to address the climate crisis. And by the way, that's how you resolve the challenges of government silos apparently not working together, of private sector objectives not being aligned with societal objectives. The challenge of externalities is really just a question of priorities. If we could get some more stories going, then maybe we can change behaviours around, as has been pointed out in thinking one of the questions, around low traffic neighbourhoods. Why on earth would people resist this? You know, what's the worst thing that could happen? We might end up somewhere nicer to live. Well, it's a question of priorities. It's a question of perceived priorities. My need to get from A to B in the direct line is more important than your need to have somewhere quiet to live or our need to have a lower carbon environment. And I think this is really important as well when we get to some of the, uh, uh, the things that we would like to see improved in the transport decarbonisation plan, or by the way, the Highways England decarbonisation plan, or any of the plethora of 
planned. Government quite consciously recognizes that it can only lead as fast as people can follow. And the transport decarb plan, uh, for example, was written with the, the experience of the 2010 fuel duty uh, uh, riots uppermost in people's minds. The story of how seatbelt legislation was brought in uh, is, is on people's minds. It didn't start with the legislation, it started with a change in perception, just as, by the way, drink driving was changed by change in perception. It starts actually with advertising in some cases. It starts with a new story. What is the story that we can all tell about the changes we need in transport that can redefine normal? This normal that we're supposed to be going back to after the pandemic, surely there's a better way to live than that. Can we not find a better normal, a better normal that enables us to play our part in the economic, social, political life of this country in a satisfying and sustainable way? So that to me is the thing that comes again and again and again from this discussion. God knows I, like everybody else, uh, uh, love to get into the technical detail, love to get into the specifics of things. But until we find a way of capturing everyone's imagination, with the difference this makes, then I'm afraid we are gonna have a huge part of technical solutions which will not get implemented at the rate and pace that we want. So I apologize if that's um, uh, simultaneously a, uh, an over ambitious and perhaps over bland observation, but I do think this, this behavioral, this storytelling, this, this, uh, um, this common conception of what good looks like is extraordinarily important. And the danger of the 150 of us collecting together with a common passion around this thing is we forget that the people out there maybe don't see things in the way that we do, don't prioritize the way we do, don't feel the urgency that we do. And giving them the similar passion that I hear from everyone who's spoken so far, and I'm sure shared by everyone who's attending, is to me the highest priority. Thanks, Peter. Thanks very much, Paul. Um, I, I just can't help, uh, resist making a short comment based on what you just said, um, which uh, about stories, I think it's crucial, crucial. And I think that links to the idea of framing as well. I mean, if I've gone and talked to communities and groups um, about transport problems at a transport level, then they're very defensive about cars, et cetera. If you talk about it at a higher level, about the future life for their kids and so on and, and safety and well-being then in a sense people view things through a different lens so i think the sort of level at which you come into these debates is also important oh, part of the stories that you yeah peter that's a great example right we, we, we've got to find a story that doesn't feel like we're taking cars away but it feels like we're giving something better let's never say we want to have fewer cars because everyone's well i'm keeping mine yeah. It's about using cars less. It's about having better opportunities, better alternatives to live the life that we need to live. That, by the way, happen to have a zero carbon impact. Yeah. Thanks very much, Paul. So we just move on now to Victoria Hills. Um, uh, Lord Deben mentioned the importance of, of planning and so on. Several other people have. So as Victoria's Chief Executive of the Royal Town Planning Institute, we look forward to your thoughts, Victoria. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter, and uh, thank you very much for the invitation to be here. I'm, as you said, Victoria is the Chief Executive of the Royal Town Planning Institute. We're the professional institute for chartered town planners. We're also a learned society, which means we get to do great research. Um, we're a membership body, um, but we're in good shape. We're now larger than we've ever been, 26,000 members, and that is a sign of the times um, that the place mm -hmm. is an element an important element and part of this conversation because that's really where we come in and it does segue nicely into what I've heard already um, or segue from what I've heard already particularly Paul there the place the opportunities and one of the things we're very passionate about is the location of development and uh, indeed it's as a town planner I got into transport planning because I was very passionate about putting the two bits together and with here we are sort of still very much having this conversation but if you get that location of development right in the first place then you're off to a flying start and so the planning framework 
the planning aspects, you know, they, they're really huge um, opportunities if we get it right. Uh, what we've discovered in our own research is that over half of developments are still located mm -hmm. over two kilometers away from a transport hub. Now, we discovered that about three years ago. We're just on our location of development two research at the moment. And that's being published later in the year to see whether it's improved. And that's going to be really important because CLG don't collect the data in that way. That's why as a learning society, we wanted to see you know, what's been consented where and is it close to transport hubs? So we will have that update um, by the end of the year. But in advance of then, we've done uh, lots of other great research, including our um, most latterly our net zero transport study. So I'm just going to pull out a couple of highlights in the five minutes I've, I've got here, if you like. And it is difficult not to repeat what's already been said. So I'm looking at my notes here to sort of focus on new areas, um, if you like. I think we've heard um, very clearly that electric transport is not a panacea to the problems and um, it's no silver bullet. It may be part of a package of solutions, but we can't just rely on that. We've got to look fundamentally at the way we travel, how we travel, why we travel. Um, and actually the pandemic has provided a, a shock to the system, to society, to our structures. But with that shock has provided a big opportunity as we have been forced to look at how we do things. And in, indeed, we were forced to stop traveling probably for the first time in any of our lives. Uh, we were actually asked not to travel anywhere at all. And I think that that's with the exception of a, you know, a short walk, perhaps. Um, and I think that's probably the first time that any of us have experienced that. Um, notwithstanding, we may have some international uh, people who may have been in different situations uh, watching today. But generally speaking, this is a big, um, you know, this is a big sort of, wow, OK, well, how are we travelling? Why are we travelling? And what are we going to be doing going forward? I'm very optimistic. And I think the hybrid model will mean that we don't go back to how we were. We'll continue to do things differently. Um, and the consumer, i.e. people, all of us, um, we'll win over in terms of what we will take the best bits of the pandemic and we'll lose the bits we didn't like, but we'll keep some of those best bits. Um, and I, I like Glenn's acknowledgement that it, there is a privilege, of course, for many of us who are able to choose to do this. That doesn't apply to everybody. Um, so location of development, huge and getting things in the right place. And when they are in the right place, designed in the right way. So, you know, really delighted to see this new national design code uh, for placemaking, if you like, that's going to embed a lot of that with um, with more technical guidance coming down the line. But, you know, for far too long, we see developments designed that don't sort of encourage people to get out their cars and walk and cycle or scoot or whatever it is. So that's that is um, a, a positive step forward. But it's also getting the right people around the table in the first place. Um, we've heard the expression silos and government silos and people working in their own way. Um, we recognise that under the current administration, the current government, there isn't going to be an immediate sort of return to regional planning uh, as we knew it. Um, so what do we do in the absence of that? Because you know, a district by district approach to placemaking doesn't really work. We've seen devolution. We've seen what comes with devolution in London, a London plan, a strategic transport strategy. We're seeing that now. Worcester in other areas. Manchester have just um, launched a consultation on their first strategic plan across, I think it's nine councils there. So, but what else do we need? Well, it's not just about public officials and politicians talking to each other. It's about getting all the right people around the table. Um, anybody who's basically got an investment strategy over the next 30 years, so that could be education providers, health providers, investors, landowners, with the statutory agencies, um, with the um, infrastructure, transport and utilities all around the table. And our solution for that is something we've called green growth boards, um, which is sort of a lep on steroids, if you like. So it's not just about spending some money through a lep. It's about getting anybody who's spending any money to bring those things together, align, identify synergies and better ways of doing things with a kind of a net zero first approach um, lens. Because one of the points I wanted to make um, was we can't just sit back and wait for government um, to not work in a siloed way. 
it's brilliant to hear the NAO talking about the work that they're doing. But my personal view is it's just not going to happen overnight, if at all. So you've just got to get on and forge innovation and opportunities in the meantime. A great example of that that I'm personally involved in mm -hmm. is I'm chairing the Net Zero Innovation Network for Essex County Council. Um, well, for the for the whole of the county. And that's about getting all those agencies I just mentioned with the money around the table um, to to provide to foster that culture of innovation and to get things to happen real time because there really isn't any time to to wait here. Somebody mentioned nine years until we change our engines. We've got nine years to deliver the sustainable development goals. Now, you know, it's great that that's now recognised within the national planning framework. It recognises those SDGs. It's probably a bit late, but better late than than never. Um, but we do need a much stronger planning framework. Lord Dibden alluded to that earlier, and we will be holding the government's feet to the fire um, as the planning bill goes through uh, later in, in the autumn. Um, and, you know, for those of us who sort of picked up um, the, the newspaper virtually today, you will see, you know, there's various rows brewing all over the place on net zero. But, you know, the green uh, bill, as it's known, which is going through the Lords at the moment, is one to watch um, in the context of this because there is a clear opportunity here, um, not just with the shock of the pandemic, but also with COP26, literally a number of weeks away now. Um, and you know the world is watching as to what we are going to do um, to really lead and pull together our other global counterparts in delivering on net zero and transport is huge, absolutely huge within that. Um, so just as I sort of wrap this up, if you like, just to focus on these opportunities, I've mentioned the pandemic as tough as it's been. Um, it has actually provided a significant opportunity for behavioural change, which many of the experts have been talking about for many years um, as we move to a hybrid uh, model. And I think there's a real opportunity there for micromobility. And interestingly, uh, by that, I mean, you know, if many of us privileged ones who, who are able to work from home two, three days a week, we are actually traveling less. Um, and those trips that we are doing, which are local ones, um, perhaps they don't, the, the need for a car is sort of gone, because if you're just doing a longer trip, either for leisure or work, um, then that does change the way you think about what you need to get around. And I see it in my own local area now, um, you know, the electric scooter trial in inverted commas is happening in London. They're everywhere where I live already. Um, and I look at that as a positive thing because the kids, I call them kids, but you know, the 20 somethings that are on those doing their local trips to get places are not in cars and they're not buying cars. And we just heard the figures there, um, which are which are kind of proving that um, to proving the point, if you like. I mentioned COP26, big opportunity. Tech is a huge opportunity, and I think where some of this innovation will lie, lie or sit is with um, the private sector and the tech uh, washing through. What will drive that? Cons the consumer. Um, the biggest opportunity on all of this are the people who aren't represented here today, and those are the people under the age of 30, um, uh, particularly under the age of 25. I genuinely believe um, that uh, the, the you know, younger people really get all of this. They're already voting with their feet. And they will lead, they're, they're our biggest promise, and um, far bigger brains than, than I've got will come up with new innovations, new technology. Um, but also, we know that they're demanding new ways of working and living. Um, and uh, the, old, the old ways of doing things, perhaps, um, will mean absolutely nothing to them. Um, and they will demand more. And I think, actually, they are our brightest hope for the future. Um, so absolutely endorse everything I've heard. Um, systems approach working together um, but actually sometimes you just got to get on and do things so working with the private sector innovating and bringing in um, our brightest future leaders is going to be a significant part of moving all of this forward so um, I hope those ramblings were helpful it's difficult to add new stuff Peter but uh, that's my start of a 10 thank you thank you very much Victoria can I invite everybody to put their cameras on now please all the speakers um, and then we can have a, a sort of more general discussion. Um, and I'd like to thank all of you for very insightful thoughts and comments. I know it's difficult to try and condense down what you want to say to five or six minutes, but um, I think you did a great job. So thank you very much indeed. Um, I'm going to pick up one or two uh, comments that came in, in uh, questions that came in in the Q&A. Uh, one from, and, and um, I think Glenn briefly mentioned this, 
uh, that Kate Pangborn raised the question about uh, what the speakers think about uh, or what role the speakers uh, see for clearly and directly supporting grassroots local third sector organisations run by the public or the citizens, if you like, to work the change as an expanding bubble of better practice at the community level. Um, if you'd like to make a comment, could you either wave at me or raise your little electronic hand, please? Uh, right, okay, John Whiteleg, thank you. Yes, um, thank you. I, I hope I'm unmuted. Uh, thank you. Um, we're already doing this in the Ludlow Parliamentary constituency in Shropshire. Um, and uh, I, I won't go into detail, there isn't time, but it's a community organisation that has produced a community plan for net zero carbon by 2030, cooperating with Philip Dunn MP, who's the chair of the House of Commons Environmental Audit Committee. Uh, we've published this, uh, Philip Dunn has waved it around in the House of Commons in the debate, and it, and it sets out in great detail the ideas supplied by the community. Uh, there are a number of people advising on this. I'm one of them. Uh, 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 so it can be done. And I think it works really well to articulate and coordinate and collate, if you like, what citizens themselves think. There's a lot more stuff out there on that that I'm not familiar with, like citizens juries. But what we're now doing in, in the Ludlow constituency is advocating a kind of a template approach where at a constituency level, voters and residents talk to their MP and produce a constituency plan that is entirely described and framed by the community. And I think that's one way to do it. Great, thank you. Anybody else like to, to comment on that? I think that sounds... Victoria, yeah. And then Glenn. Well, just very briefly, if we're taking a systems approach, the best way I think to do that is that it should integrate with neighbourhood planning. Um, neighbourhood planning has been beefed up uh, significantly. There's a greater role for looking at um, where new homes are needed um, within communities. So, you know, if you've got local transport uh, groups, community groups, that absolutely uh, needs to be dovetailed in with the neighbourhood plan. Um, right at the grassroots level. And so that's that's a classic example where we need to move away from different silos and actually bringing things together. And there's no better way to do that, I would say this, wouldn't I, than through the local plan, uh, which we are told by government is going to be, you know, really beefed up with more community engagement upstream so that things are simplified downstream. Um, we're obviously asking for a stack load of funding so we can have genuine community engagement planners on the ground leading all of that. Um, and I think that's uh, that, that that would be a, a significant way forward if you joined that up via the neighbourhood plan. Thank you, Greg. You wanted to comment? Yeah, thanks, um, Peter. Uh, so um, I've long advocated place-based approach to this because we know it's going to look different and feel different in different communities. Um, I think that is somewhat different from um, saying that we we're going to put responsibility down at that scale it still needs to be a partnership we need to say what the constraints are and we need to say and be able to describe what's going to happen in a kind of macro sense everywhere so that communities kind of have access to those resources but I, I really don't see how we're going to deliver this transition at the kind of scale that we need to and the pace that we need to with just the resources which are within what we might see as a normal transport planning profession so we definitely have to reach out to all the expertise that's out there and also to connect to how people actually want things to work in their areas. I think we'll see a lot of innovation. I think if you wanted to see how the last mile should be fixed, talk to people uh, about how they do it and, and how they could do it, for example. Thanks. Thanks very much. Anybody else want to pick up on this one? Yeah, Glenn, yeah. Uh, yeah, um, I think for me, the community group focus really resonates with the notion that we need to be influencing politics and politicians. Um, I'm just at the early stages of reading a book called The New Climate War by Michael Mann, which I can recommend to people. And, and that's all about um, deflection. And I've come to, um, to reference to storytelling from Paul in a moment. Um, and the, the emphasis there is that the, those that want the status quo are pointing the finger at individual behavior change. It's, it's us, the consumer, that has to change, not, not the system, not the producer and the supplier. 
Um, and, and of course, we can all change our behaviours, but we really need to, to be changing the system. And the, the agency we have to do that is through influencing and supporting our local politicians. And here's where I worry. I, I absolutely agree in one sense with Paul's point about stories and the power of storytelling. Um, but let's be very clear. There are lots of vested interests making up their own stories. Um, to give you an example from the US, gun control, how many lives are lost, um, the story that's being told for those who want to protect the status quo and sell guns is guns don't kill people, people kill people. Um, there's a story for you. There's a story that will happily confuse anyone who's saying guns are the problem. Uh, and this is what we're going to see. Interestingly, only this morning um, on social media was the announcement that the Murdoch press have decided to go from supporting climate change denial um, to supporting net zero. Well, that's an interesting change. They're going to change their story that's going to influence millions and millions of voters. Um, and so, yes, I think our agency as individuals, we need to be storytellers. But my worry is that by all of us telling our own story, as we've done this morning, it's actually going to create confusion. And confusion is exactly what the status quo wants, because it slows down the momentum to go in the direction we need. You, you succeeded in uh, rousing Paul, who desperately wants to make a, a short response, please, Paul. Yeah. Um, so, of course, of course, Glenn, you're right. Uh, but, but, you know, your example, I, we really shouldn't get into uh, American politics, but your example of, of guns is, is, is a power of stories which are generated and supported by money. And if it's true that the money and the influence of, uh, um, from um, a certain media empire is going to fall behind... Um, uh, the need for net zero, that's really great news. The point, I, I, I think we've got to understand stories will be told, right? So if we think we've got a better story or a story that delivers better outcomes than the others, then the onus is on us to tell it. And no, we mustn't all have our own story because you know we'll get lost in the noise, but we've got to generate some compelling visions of how life will be better our way. At like the moment, all our stories are blooming negative stories. We've got to take people's cars away. Like, what do you think? How are people are going to react? You know, oh, well, you're going to have to walk more. Really? You know, we're like, we, we've got to help people to see a better future. So, you know, I, I, I hear what you say. It's not just stories, but stories also lead government. Right? This really, really important point. Government will only lead insofar as they believe that people will follow. And when they think that the ball is rolling, they'll, they'll absolutely put their resources and their voice behind it, but they're very reluctant to try and start the ball rolling because they don't want to be out ahead of everybody too much. Okay, thank you. I'm going to move on to a different point now, actually, which has come up in a couple of the, the questions. First of all, Gillian Allable made a point responding particularly something that you said, John, um, that in fact, if you look at average carbon uh, per capita carbon emissions for personal travel in countries like Germany and Netherlands, they're no low, lower than in the UK, despite the high share of uh, active travel for local trips. And, and therefore, in a sense, um, highlighting how uh, active travel is a major contributor is, is very good in health terms. But when you look at total kilometres travelled, it doesn't really make a big difference. And, and Graham Pendlebury came up with a related point saying that he felt the biggest challenge was in the five to 25 mile range, because that's too far for most people to walk or cycle. It's too short for rail journeys. Um, and often these journeys don't neatly fit a long bus corridor. So, um, so both questions in a sense about how do we, the active travel, very local trips, but in terms of carbon, it's probably the next range up that's the real challenge. And do people have any suggestions for how we might deal with that? Thank you. You go first, John, yeah. Yeah, okay, just a quick comment. First of all, it, 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 we tend to get bogged down with data, so I'm going to avoid that. But in places where I've worked in great detail, for example, in Gothenburg and Lund in Sweden and Freiburg and uh, uh, some other German places, the, the model share stats uh, are very reliable. We don't even have them in Britain that are reliable. So in those places, it's quite normal to have 30 to 40% of all trips every day by walk and cycle, and a further 20% by public transport, usually one quarter or one third of my car. Now, when you translate that into per capita carbon emissions, that gets a bit tricky for lots of reasons. So I'm, not, I'm not going to go there, but I think we've got to be careful about international comparisons and make sure we look at the actual overall policies, the way those are implemented at, at the local level and geography. 
you know, it's quite clear that in rural Sweden, uh, we, we have very much reduced per capita emissions compared to in Shropshire, where I'm now working, trying to work with the council who are very uncooperative, uh, that 37% of all our carbon emissions are from the transport sector. It's, it's over 40% in places like Devon. So um, uh, there is a statistical argument, which I don't think is appropriate for today. But the, the important thing is to emphasize what we can do to alter modal split data, what we can do to change behavior, and what we can do to actually promote policies which benefit everybody. I think Lord Dieber made the point and other people made the point that I don't see any of this as anti-motorist. I want to see lots less car use. And when you look at places like Freiburg in, in uh, an urban area in Germany and uh, parts of Sweden where I lived, the rural areas, there's a much higher percentage of use of non-car alternatives. So that's where we're heading for it. And we can demonstrate that the policies work. OK, thank you, John. Anybody else like to pick up on that? The challenge of the beyond the walking and cycling range of trips. Glenn. Yeah, I, I, I'm, maybe this is a little bit superficial, particularly after John's reference to data. Um, but I think the first question is, will it remain a five to 25 mile window in terms of that high volume uh, of trips? Uh, and in two respects, that might change. Um, well, first of all, that, as we know from Victoria's world of planning, um, and there's a lot of contention at the moment around the 15 minute neighbourhood. But if we're starting to move the activities that people are looking to access closer to the where they live, then the distribution may shift more towards five to 10, five to 15 miles. Then that becomes within reach of the new technologies like e-bikes and so on. Um, but into that mix as well, of course, uh, is the role of digital substitution for some people some of the time. So I, I think it's not as straightforward as it has been in the past of saying, how do we replace a 20 mile car journey with something else? Um, because clearly that's challenging as things currently stand unless we invest massively uh, in public transport. And I think to some extent that's an old fashioned framing now uh, of the situation that we're facing and the opportunities. OK, so, so to sort of paraphrase what I think you're saying, Glenn, is that the answer to how you replace a 20 mile car trip might be within a one or two mile uh, trip by walking or cycling or something, or even uh, doing things over the Internet instead. So, in part, yes. Yeah, in yeah. part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. OK, Victoria, you want to come in on that? Yes, I mean, I completely agree with what Glenn's just said, actually, um, that I do think the, the pandemic has been a real game changer and that we are going to be reframing uh, the context because what I've tried to explain probably a bit badly before is that um, I think our travel patterns are, are are going to have have changed but will continue to a certain element to stay as they as they were and and um, in the pandemic and it just to show you a structural change which would have been unthinkable perhaps in town planning terms two years ago just today the government's launched um, consultation to keep in place um, the changes that they made um, that enable temporary structures and outside stuff to happen on high streets. Now, in licensing terms before, this was a big no-no, we're not having it. Um, it's actually been so popular and actually, to some extent, has saved the high streets. And we all know in our local area, there's a lot more going on um, than perhaps would have been outside. For the government to now launch a formal consultation, basically, to make these changes permanent is an indication that the 20 minute or 15 minute neighborhood isn't just a back of the fag packet. This is actually now happening real time because if these changes become permanent, they do provide a real structural change and a lifeline to our local neighborhoods um, to actually keep us a lot more local as we work local, not all of us, um, as we work a lot more local, we're home sort of three days a week and there's stuff going on, markets, out, outside stuff. So I think going forward, um, that not for everybody, for, but for people who can work in an agile way, um, that they will probably choose to work from home two to three days a week, which sees them work living in a very micro world and then doing a longer journey, longer than that 25 um, mile potential or 25 minutes, sorry, I, I, I didn't, but a, a much longer journey, uh, which may involve a two hour train journey, either to go and see friends or family or for work, but the rest of the time, I think there's an opportunity. We actually bake in a lot more hyper local mobility than we've than we've ever thought possible, um, because people quite like that actually, and they and they do get the story of actually travelling less, being in the local area, 
my own travel habits have changed and will continue to. And I'm doing exactly what Glenn's doing. So I'm staying local today, hyper local. Um, may walk somewhere a bit later. That's about it. Tomorrow I'll be getting on a train to Manchester to attend a conference, and then I'll be hyper local again on Friday. And uh, you know, when when I get back, I don't need a car for any of that. And you know, I, I, I can see that whole business model looking quite precarious for people owning cars going in. In if what we're seeing these structural changes continue, and um, and you know, this is this is a systems approach. This is planning policy. That, as I said, you know, it would have been a real no-no to have all of this stuff continuing, but they're, they're seriously consulting on it. And I would encourage anybody listening who's interested in that to respond, because that means that 20-minute neighbourhoods can actually become a real thing, because the viability of places to stay open on, you know, dwindling high streets is okay. suddenly a game changer. Thank you. Greg, last uh, comment on this one. I think you wanted to make a point. Yeah, so um, I don't disagree with um, what Victoria has just said about the great potential for 20 minute neighbourhoods and, and actually this will change the dynamic of those people with our sorts of working patterns. But just a salutary note, I think that um, the work that Gillian Annabelle and myself and colleagues have been doing on COVID suggests that those people who have had to continue to travel to work during the pandemic have most likely been those living in more disadvantaged areas on the edges of cities who've who've been reliant on on the car and again i go back to the point i made in my initial comments we haven't had a discussion uh, really about fairness in the transition so um you know this is not going to happen evenly across society there are some people who've got no public transport alternative to the sorts of things that their lives revolve around uh, and who don't have an awful lot of money in a car dependent and i think if we're going to take a whole systems approach to it, it involves thinking about all sorts of different people in all sorts of different places um, and i'm not sure that we've we've yet really got a, a full handle on that okay thank you um robin brownsaw said should public transport subsidy of city center charging points be banned as with road building it leads to induced traffic and is the opposite of what we're looking to achieve and if i can sort of slightly more generalize that we're we're bringing in various incentives and things um and are we i mean one example is i think some places have suggested maybe that um electric cars might be allowed in bus lanes well you know that that obviously is okay when there's only uh, you know 0.1 percent of the car fleet but can't work when it becomes majority are we danger are we in danger in the sense of some of these short-term incentives potentially locking ourselves into long-term problems i don't know who would like to comment on that general point or not yeah david good just the, the thought of electric cars in bus lanes horrifies me. Um, I because, thought it would. Because obviously it then slows down the buses, but what's worse than that, all the experience I've had from in London is if you don't easily identify who is allowed to be in a bus lane, as soon as somebody sees something else going in a bus lane that looks like them, they will follow them. And then you then it just becomes, you know, you, you, this, the, the enforcement of bus lanes is a combination of either the um, either camera enforcement or actually people enforcing it themselves by, by their behaviours. So uh, there's lots of scope at the moment for putting things to encourage people to take get to go to electric vehicles. Don't put them in bus lanes, please. That is not the right way forward. So that's my only comment. I, I thought that might rouse your direction there, David. A any other comments, slightly more general, about the, the danger of perhaps of these short-term incentives actually locking us in or, or making it more difficult to shift later on? Or you don't think we've got... Paul, yeah. Well, as the famous saying, there's nothing more permanent than the temporary. Um, income tax introduced uh, around the time of the Napoleonic Wars to uh, uh, plug a short-term funding gap. Um, don't see it going away anytime soon. So I completely agree. I, I think um, we, we there are some things which are perfect opportunities for short-term tactical things. So as you know, Tori was saying, uh, the some of the uh, reactive short-term temporary measures that were introduced in the pandemic turn out to be great ideas and you know we should be we should be uh, uh, using those perhaps at the local level or, or um, in circumstances where they are reversible at the level of wider infrastructure networks I think we need to be really really cautious about that 
Um, it's already been picked up a few times in the morning. Uh, there's a huge amount of money. There's a lot of resources in those networks. And we absolutely need to be thinking about how that money gets used. Should all that money be devoted uh, to it? What? It, how are we going to use the assets of the quarter of a million miles of roads around the country? What are they for? Are they for street parties and you know, uh, teaching your kids to ride a bike? Are they for cycling? Are they for e-bikes? Are they for last mile? Are they for, or are they just going to be for uh, one and a half tons of metal accelerating at 30 miles an hour? You know, you know what, do, what do we want? What's the mix? That is a societal discussion. And it sort of needs to be done once, I think. Um, there can be a palette of options that can be applied differently locally, but I don't think it makes sense on that massive national asset, which is so integral to uh, you know, the, all, all aspects of our, um, of our thriving to uh, have a balkanization of solutions. We have to, we've got to have some big answers to that. So you know, we need a mix, um, sometimes small, sometimes big, sometimes temporary. Are we very, very careful um, about going too temporary or, you know, when things are not going to be reversible? Just to pick up on two, two things you said there, Paul. I mean, one is the new highway code is, is proposing to put pedestrians at the top. And that's obviously quite a shift. So that's an interesting development. Although I don't think having something universal is necessarily very sensible. Wouldn't make sense on ring roads and things necessarily to the same degree. Um, but the other point I was reading Bill Gates's book a while ago about you know how, how to get down to carbon zero, and he made a point about it's very dangerous to do things incrementally because you can end up in a worse situation. He gives the example of, for example, getting rid of coal-fired power stations. If you want a quick win, you convert them to gas, but actually, if you in the long run, that's not a very good use of investment money. So I think this thing about horizons as well is re is really quite important. John, I think you wanted to come in on this, did you? Just a quick comment. Uh, I think it was Paul used the phrase big ideas, which is something that buzzes around in my small head quite a lot. And I suspect that and this is self-criticism, by the way, not, not of anyone else in this discussion. I suspect that we're all fo focusing too much on the detail and not enough on the big ideas. And I keep floating uh, the, the thought that if we are going to decarbonize transport and we are going to deal with social justice and we are going to deal with public health and we are going to deal with congestion, uh, all these things actually require the same small number, small number of big ideas. Uh, usually I get shot down at this point, but I, 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 I need to throw them into this discussion. Uh, so what I will do next Monday when I'm in charge, when I'm the fat controller of transport in the United Kingdom, is have totally free for public transport. All public transport in Britain, well, England, let's say, will be free, right? And that will be funded by uh, a general uh, dynamic road pricing model that uh, will apply across the whole country. Uh, we'll have Vision Zero, we'll have 20 mile per hour on every residential road, we'll abolish pavement parking. Uh, the this gets a bit longer, but the main things are full free fare public transport, vision zero, 20 mile per hour, and, and uh, car free cities and car free towns. And that then requires a detailed process of engagement and information. And uh, I think this has cropped up already. You know, the, the population, citizens, residents are, are not really being encouraged to think about things more deeply and more widely. And I'm part of the problem. You know, I argue about uh, let's build a new cycle path, you know, from a particular particular school to a particular catchment area. So I'm uh, messing about in the detail. But I think unless we shift or find a way to shift to the big ideas and, and hit the whole decarbonization agenda really, really firmly with big impact ideas, we will fail because uh, the status quo is encouraged by piddling around with how we improve buses and walking and cycling. And I've spent 30 years piddling around. So uh, I'm, I'm the main guilty party. Uh, lesson over. You've done enough piddling. OK, that's great. Actually, David, um, several people, the point John made about free public transport, several people have put that um, in the questions. I mean, what, what's the bus industry view about that? Um, it's not so much a bus industry view. I mean, it, it gets in huge amounts of complications over over who's paying to whom and what what level of funding and all those sorts of things. I have a I actually for someone who wants to get people onto public transport, I'm in, in intrinsic dislike of free fares simply because I don't think people then value it properly, and I don't think it really. I, I think I think fares for segmented uh, parts of the community, fares that 
uh, challenge people in terms of, you know, they say, well, it's cheaper to go by car with four people and rather than go on a bus. All those sorts of fares and subsidies and in promotions, I'm up for all of that. But free fares, I've never really been a great, a great lover of free fares. There's, I can't quote off the top of my head some of the studies, but it gets to a point where people don't don't value what they've got. And you haven't got a way of measuring that value either. OK, thank you. Um, I want to move on now to think a bit more about rural areas. Uh, again, several people have made the point um, that obviously in uh, in cities or small towns, then walking and cycling for short trips becomes quite viable um, because you've got good networks and because most things are quite accessible, you know, the sort of 15 minute city idea. But in more rural areas, out of suburban rural areas, obviously uh, many people perhaps feel they don't have much alternative to using a car. Um, and obviously that relates both on the passenger side and also on the freight side. Um, and I wonder if people have got thoughts about how we deal with decarbonisation in, in a more outer suburban or, or rural environment. Ah, Paul, yeah. So uh, one, of the, one of the points raised in uh, the Q&A, uh, I think is relevant here. Um, over the past few decades, we've actually seen the centralization of many, many uh, services. So the local school is closed because it's cheaper, more efficient, and delivers better outcomes to have bigger schools, which can employ more, better teachers. Ditto, the local doctor's surgery has been consolidated. The local hospital has been closed, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so uh, we have built over a period of decades, the scenario where, rural uh, um, people living in rural areas have to travel further for a lot of things. Now, it wasn't always so. Um, what we need to do is we need to uh, you know, think about how people participate in a, in a, in a sustainable life. I'm impeaching myself here, but deliberately. Uh, you know, what are the things that they need to do to have an, a, a life that properly participates, that's a, that, that's a satisfying, sufficient life, and then work out what's the optimal way to generate it. And that, if that means we have to set different constraints on, uh, uh, you know, on some of the organisations that, that set those services, then the sooner we get on with that, the sooner we'll start delivering it. You know, there, there are, uh, the cities are more efficient because people are more closely packed. That is a statement of geometry that isn't going to go away. But that doesn't mean that we are doomed to, uh, uh, to operate lower density areas in the way that we do today. We do have choices, but we're going to have to recognise that the choices are encoded into the built environment, encoded into the way that we provide our services, and there isn't a magic way to fix this. So we have to Oh, we ought to take the, take the, have the courage to open those constraints or we're going to get what we've always got. OK, thank you very much. Yeah, Lauren, please. I think if we had a, a blank sheet of paper, we could, you know, redesign the UK from, from the ground up and, and have ideal kind of public transport systems that work for everyone. But I think where, where we are now, the reality is that a lot of people for the medium and long term will need cars, whether that's in rural areas or whether that's in, in semi-urban areas. Now, I know, for example, my son plays football on a Saturday morning. He could be anywhere within a 15 mile distance of me that I need to be at, at nine o'clock on a, on a Saturday. There's no way I can uh, expect him to cycle or use public transport for most of that. So, you know, while I recognise and support all the need to, to encourage more active travel and the, the shift of public transport, we do still need to look in the short term for solutions to, to help people transition to the cleanest form of transport that they can. And, and for many people, for now, that will, be, that will be a car. So, you know, finding solutions for consumers to be able to switch to an electric vehicle from their older diesel and petrol vehicles today and to, to charge those vehicles where they need to, I think, will be important. I just want to make sure we don't lose lose sight of that as we uh, talk about the utopian example of moving to public transport for all. Thanks, Lauren. Um, Alan, on the sort of freight logistics side, you know, last mile deliveries is very fashionable at the moment, but in, in more rural areas or out of suburban areas, I mean, what are the options there? Obviously electrification, but, but are there options to maybe uh, do deliveries in conjunction with public transport operators in more rural areas or are drones a serious proposition? What, what, what do you think is the outlook in that sort of environment? Okay, just before I answer your question, Peter, um, can I just say we've been discussing this for about two hours and freight has hardly been mentioned. 
Um, I, I, it's almost a bit like the transportation uh, decarbonisation document, which again has very little specifically on freight. A lot of people talk about freight blindness. There was a national infrastructure commission report that, that said at local government level that freight just that freight is between 25, 20 and 25 percent of transport related emissions, and yet it so seldom gets discussed in these events. So I noticed that one of the uh, responses in the chat box was somebody saying, why can't we say more about freight? So anyway, j just addressing your specific uh, That's question. That's why I asked you, Alan. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, but, but you're, you're relating it just to rural areas. Well, um, okay. Just on that, that subject, um, I mean, if I had a pound uh, for everybody uh, who's asked me the question over the years, is, is it better to shop online as to drive to the shops? And I'd be a wealthy man. Uh, and my answer is, is always, it depends. Uh, there are so many variables you have to play around with. Um, I, I think th there are ways, uh, just backtracking a bit, um, a lot of personal travel is shopping related. Um, we're currently in the midst of a retail revolution as we move from um, you know, shop-based retailing towards online retailing, which is impacting, I think, in different parts of the country in different ways. Um, I mean, I, I think you, you could come up with uh, what we call fulfillment models, you know, how you supply goods to people. Do they go and collect them or do they get delivered to the home or to some reception box? You, you can create um, a, a, a scenario, if you like, where there is a lot of online delivery in rural areas, which can be done in a very carbon efficient way where people don't have to travel to the shops right now. Uh, regrettably, that might mean the closure of a lot of local shops, and it will then impact on certain sectors of the population. Um, but, uh, but, but I think, unfortunately, th there is so little research and discussion of this. Most of the last mile research is done on urban areas rather than rural areas. And you mentioned drones. Um, I, again, I've written papers on the possible use of drones in last mile delivery. I think it's going to be uh, a relatively small scale development. It's going to be a niche development for certain types of product for people who are prepared to pay premium rates. I don't think drones are going to revolutionize uh, the delivery of products to, to the home. And just one final point I'll make uh, is so far, there's been much discussion about changing travel behavior. But I think we also have to think about changing consumer behavior, because if we're looking at the decarbonization of freight, a number of things could help here. The move to the circular economy, greater sharing of products, concern, just reducing the amount of stuff that we have to move. And the other thing, and this is something that Lord uh, Deepen mentioned, is people now are expecting to have almost instant delivery at no cost. Unfortunately, we're conditioning whole generation to believe that logistics is so good and so cost-free that we can provide that service. And that is so wrong. You know, somehow we have to get the message across to people that there, if, if you get that fast delivery, we're using more energy, we're emitting more CO2. Um, and, and therefore that is just a very environmentally unfriendly way to behave as a consumer. Just some thoughts, thank you. Thank you. Your point about us getting locked into certain ways of thinking remind me of something totally different, but I'll mention it. Um, somebody was saying they, that they saw a young child go up to a shop window recently and try and swipe the window, expecting to see something else if they managed to swipe it. And uh, that's a sort of indication of uh, where young, very young generation is going, I think. Um, Glenn, was it you wanted to make a comment? Yeah. Yeah, um, thanks, Alan, for those remarks um, about freight boats in rural areas and more generally. Um, my, my concern with the last point you made, which was alluding to, uh, in, as, as I understood it, you know, consumers need to understand that, um, I think plays into the, the issue of deflection. Um, and interestingly, within the transport decarbonisation plan, um, reference was made to the DFT's own behavioural change research, uh, which underlined that convenience and cost are the main determinants of behaviour, uh, just as you've alluded to yourself. And I, I you know, perish the thought that our answer to decarbonising um, freight is to have drones, um, because it, it seems as though you know, we're perpetuating the problem, we're allowing the problem to grow. It's, it's some, somewhat analogous to Peter's point about putting electric cars in bus lanes. Um, it seems that we should be recognising yet again that travels are derived demand. Um, if my suit is, you know, not that I'll need to buy a suit anymore, I hope, but if there's an attempt to deliver it three times, uh, and then when it arrives, it's the wrong colour or the wrong size, and I send it back again, that shouldn't be allowed to be happening. And I'm sure you'll tell us that things like that are changing. But the idea it's, it's sort of 
foisted upon the consumer and then the industry says well the consumer wants this you know they want convenience so we must fulfill that and then we have initiatives of course innovation is all about technology so we end up with initiatives to create fleets of drones delivering my suit and then coming and collecting it the next day because i don't want it J just seems you know herein lies madness okay thanks I i'm sure john uh, alan would come back with a comment but we've only got about five minutes so i'm afraid i'm not going to give him the the opportunity to do that um and so I think I'm just going to close that. And I'm sorry for people who have not had a chance to. Oh, Victoria's looking desperate. Are you? Well, just don't forget, don't forget the tech for rural. I think tech will be yeah. part of it. I completely recognise the need for car in rural areas. But does does do people need a car 24 hours a day, seven days a week going forward? Possibly not. So there will be some tech solutions here that means we can do things smarter. Yeah. OK. Um, I'm conscious that uh, Johnny, um, if you're with us, yeah. You've, you've not said, said anything since you made your earlier comments. You've obviously listened to what's been said over the last hour or so. Anything you'd like to chip in before we close? Uh, thanks, Peter, for the opportunity. I'll keep it very brief because uh, it demands on time. I think, obviously, look, I'm looking at this from a central government perspective. Um, and it's been uh, incredibly illuminating for me to hear all these uh, uh, different perspectives today. I think one of the things that's uh, key for us, which has been picked up on uh, by a number of uh, uh, different speakers today, is actually turning the plans into reality now. Uh, when you look at the ambitions government has got and the number of different strategy documents that have been produced and are promised over the coming months, the challenge of actually turning that into something deliverable and deliverable at the pace that's required uh, in the plans that are set out. Um, you look, for instance, at the transport decarbonisation plan and you look at the scale of impact that's planned from 2025 onwards. Um, a significant amount of work needs to happen between now and then to begin making that uh, a reality. And, um, you know, speaking to the department and speaking to others around government, I don't think anyone's under any illusions around the scale of that challenge. But the time now in which to, uh, to achieve that, to put that in place, uh, is, uh, is shrinking. Uh, and it's something we're pressing on in a lot of our work is, yes, there are the ambitions and uh, yes, there is the policy direction. Where is government now in terms of delivering this into plans that can be achieved? Where we start to see the difference on the plan that's being uh, on the plans that are set out. So, I'll finish with that kind of uh, that kind of over, very sort of high level overarching remark. If that's okay, Peter. No, that's fine. Thank you very much. I think it's important to to bring us back to to the challenge that the government faces and in, in, in the ways in which the private sector, individuals, uh, organisations can work with them to achieve that. Uh, Paul, do you want you? You've been very silent. Would you like to make a brief comment? Yeah, I would. Thanks, Peter. I mean, I was thinking of myself as a consumer, really. The conversation that was happening earlier about you know living in a semi-rural environment, which, which I do. I don't think there's enough happening at the moment to influence the decisions that people are making. And um, you know, there's nothing really that, that stops, makes me stop and think really hard about getting in the car and making the trips that people have talked about making that we don't need to make. And equally, the number of deliveries. You know, one of the one of the I think features of, of life has been the number of deliveries that you see arriving at the door every day, which in the past I'd never seen when I was, wasn't working from home as much as I am now. But actually, you know, what is it that's stopping people from doing those things? I don't think there's enough encouragement in the right direction to make green, salute, make green choices. And I think we've really got to work hard at that in the short term. Otherwise, I think we will be stuck in a rut uh, of this car-led recovery that's just going to get worse and worse. So that's I suppose just a concern that I've really got, and I think we need policy around that as soon as we can uh, to start helping people make the right choices that I'm sure a lot of people want to make, uh, but I'll probably haven't got the, the tools they need or at least the information they think they need to understand the impact of what they're doing. So that's, that's a concern I've got. Okay, thank you very much, Paul. Claire, would you like to put your camera on just as we're concluding, if you're there? Um, ah. Yes, there she comes. Hi. I am indeed. Yes, I've been really enjoying the discussion, Peter. Thank you so much. Everyone. I've been deliberately staying out and wanting to hear what everyone has to say. I mean, it's been fantastic. I mean, I, I know we're short of time and I want to give you an opportunity, Peter, to say any closing remarks. I think one thing I would um, highlight, I mean, Glenn or Greg mentioned, you know, we haven't talked about much about fair and just transition. It's fundamental. Um, that will be something we will be really focusing on on our third session. Um, but of course, everything, all the themes that we've been discussing at the Greenland Transport Council kind of come up um, in all of the, in all of the um, 
in all of the webinars. There's just so much to cover. Um, so I think really, in the interest of time, just a big thank you to everyone. It's been brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Thank you. Thanks very much, Claire. Um, yeah, Claire uh, made it clear my number one job was to finish on time, so I, I aim to do that. Um, but I'd like to first of all thank all the speakers, panellists, for their contributions. Um, I know it's been very challenging to get what you wanted to say down into five minutes and then give concise answers to questions, but I really appreciate that. There's so much that's come out of this, and I hope it's being well captured and recorded and be summarised afterwards. Um, apologies for those who put questions um, online and there wasn't time to answer them all. I'm sorry we couldn't get around to everybody, um, but I think we did manage to cover a number of issues there. Um, I'll just make very two very brief thoughts, really. What, one was going back to Paul's comment about it all comes down to restructuring of society. Um, and I think that's that's really the challenge. You know, transport is an important part of that, but it's also about how we how we uh, attain goods and services, how we socialise, how we do leisure, etc. Because uh, obviously there's also when we talk about switching things to online, obviously online itself, um, uh, at the moment anyway, uh, uses a lot of uh, energy and so on. So I, it is really this big picture thing that's very important. One of the things that I wrestle with off and on, off and on is, is this thing about people in their dual role as citizens and as consumers. And you know, in many ways, people spend their lives as consumers being encouraged to purchase what they need and what they want. On the other hand, when we see the collective response, uh, collective consequences of that, often as citizens, we decide we don't want all those cars or we don't want all this pollution or whatever. And it's interesting tension, tension or, or issue about when do people, when do get, situations get to a point where people stop being individual consumers and respond more as collective citizens that actually enable some of these tipping points. And I think there's probably an interesting PhD for somebody there. Anyway, so it's just about quarter two now. So um, I'd like to draw this to a close. Thank all our speakers, thank the participants uh, who've been listening and giving questions, and I look forward to the next event in a week's time. Thank you all very much. Goodbye. <laughs>